Hello everyone, FPL Raptor here and welcome back to another video on my YouTube channel. In today's video, we have the final piece of content of the 21-22 season. It's going to be a retrospective look back at the season that has just gone, a bit of a season review. We're going to look at things that went well, things that didn't go so well, and lessons we can learn and take forward into next season. Just wanted to say quickly before we do jump in, massive, massive thank you for all of the support this season. It's been an absolutely incredible journey and I've loved every second of creating content for you and long may it continue into next season as well. But without further ado, let's jump to today's video. So guys, for the final time of this season, massive, massive shout out to Ultimate Champions who have supported the channel all season with these sponsorships. And if you would like to support me for one final time for free, please do just give Ultimate Champions a go. And the main benefit of this is that if you think you're going to miss FPL over the summer, Ultimate Champions is a fantasy football game, free to play, powered by the blockchain. You collect your favorite cards as NFTs or non-fungible tokens. You build the best team you possibly can, and this will run throughout the summer as well as they're looking at getting some different leagues involved. Once you build that team, the better it does in real life, the better the points you earn, the more points you earn the better the rewards you then can open different packs either by buying them or just getting them for free via your rewards build the best best possible team you can then sell and trade those players on the marketplace as you can see here it's just a super cool game and i genuinely genuinely do think that you'll enjoy it so for the final time this this season please do click the link in the description first link there will take you to ultimate champions you can give that a go and if you do download ultimate champions let me know what you think of it down below so guys, I'm hoping this video isn't going to be too long, but just in case it does run over and it is quite a long one, I thought I would just start by giving you the general structure for this video. We're going to start with the FPL awards, which is just a bit of fun to start the video off. And I do want to know down below in the comments, who do you think deserve the accolades for this season? We're then going to look at just a couple of interesting FPL stats that I've picked out from across the season, both for players and teams, maybe some stuff we can take into next year. We're then going to take a bit of a look at the effectiveness of my decisions using the what if machine, which is a really, really cool feature. We've then got my sort of season progression and rank and and a bit of a discussion around whether I think it's the sort of rank that I deserved with a bit of an analysis of luck this season as well. And we actually have some statistical models which can project, were you lucky or were you unlucky? And we can take a bit of a look at that as well. We've also got some stuff around captaincy analysis across the season and also a bit of a look at the captaincy swings because to be honest, they were absolutely massive this season. And I want to take a bit of a look about what those swings were. Were they the correct decision and a bad outcome or should I potentially pick the other player? We're then going to look at my FPL team of the season and the players that have earned me the most points with respect to my overall rank and also just total points. And then we're going to finish off with some lessons learned and maybe some things that we can take into next season. Obviously being a bit careful because every season is completely different. Hopefully you will enjoy the video. Like I said, chapters will be down below for all of these different sections. But without further ado, let's jump into the FPL awards. As I said, a bit of fun to start the video. Here are some FPL awards in my personal opinion, and I'm open to debate, but down below, I'd like you to follow the same structure as me, give out a different award for each of these categories. And if you want to, you can also introduce some different categories yourself and some different awards and get creative with it as well. So what I've got to start with is the best goalkeeper, defender, midfield and midfielder and forward. For these first four, this is for my personal team. The rest of them are just my opinion, but for these first four, it's actually my specific team. So everyone's will probably be quite different. Starting off within goal, and we're going to discuss this a bit later in the video, Ramsdale has arguably been my player of the season, the player that has earned me the most points relative to those around me. I jumped on Ramsdale at the perfect time just as he started to go into that run of clean sheets, and then I sold him when he started to lose out on the clean sheets. So for me, Ramsdale is probably the best player that I've owned this season, and definitely the best goalkeeper. Moving on to the defence, there have been loads of brilliant defenders, Trent Alexander-Arnold, Rhys James, Cancelo, but the one for me that I've owned, again, for most of the season and all of the right points has to be Cancelo, and he hasn't earned me that many points because he's been so highly owned but I definitely didn't lose out on any points as a result of Cancelo and I owned him at all of the critical points and I actually captained him for two of the game weeks as well so for me due to the fact that he started the season the season at fairly cheap in comparison to the likes of Trent and Robertson and also just due to the sheer amount of points that he got Cancelo is my defender of the season midfielder of the season was a tough one I actually haven't really had one. I looked at some of the statistics and I've also thought back to myself, there's really been no midfielders that I've genuinely loved owning across the entirety of the season. Obviously, Bowen was quite good at points, but I didn't own him for a lot of his hauls. I look at the likes of sort of Foden and Jota. I did own them at various points for some hauls, but a lot of these players have also harmed my rank as well. And I look, I don't think there's genuinely, apart from maybe Salah, but again, Salah has harmed my rank on various occasions. There aren't really midfield, many midfielders that I've genuinely enjoyed owning and that I've 
basically got all of their hauls and haven't missed out on any of their points. So for me, Saka's probably the closest I can get to that. Again, I've captained him on one or two occasions and I owned him for that period from like game week 26 to game week 30 when he got a few double digit hauls. I did own him for that period. So I would say that probably Saka is just about my midfielder of the season. And of course, he's had an absolutely incredible season in real life for Arsenal as well. So I think he definitely deserves a mention. And then my best forward is a similar situation, but I think best forward for pretty much everyone the forwards have been terrible this year. Again, we'll speak about this a bit later. There haven't been many good forwards. You've got the likes of sort of Kane has ticked along quite nicely after a pretty slow start to the season. Antonio exploded in the first sort of four or five game weeks. He's got about 60 points and then he tailed off. I did own Ronaldo for a couple of hauls, but I also captained him two or three times for some potential blanks in there. So there really weren't that many. And to be honest, during that same period that I owned Saka, I also owned Lacazette. And I think I got like five or six assists out of him and one penalty goal. So... Probably the, the striker that has been the best striker for me this season, scarily, is Lacazette, who didn't even really score many goals this season. So let me know down below again when you do your FPL awards. Are there any strikers that you actually enjoyed owning? Probably not. For player of the season, this could have been Salah, this could have been Son. Obviously, they were the two top point scorers. But for me, it's got to be Bowen. Like I said, I didn't own him for all of his hauls. But when you look at his price, with respect to sort of value, Bowen has got to be the player. And he, he was in the top point scorers for the entirety of the season at his price. He was an absolute bargain and he continued to tick along across the entirety of the season. From the very first few game weeks, I know a lot of us owned Ben Rama, but Bowen did very, very well. Through the middle section of the season, he was unbelievable. And then since returning from injury, he's continued to deliver FPL, to, F, FPL returns and FPL points as well. So I think Bowen definitely deserves more recognition from FPL managers. I think he's got to be the FPL player of the season, in my personal opinion. With respect to underrated player and cheap player, these could have gone back and forth. They're pretty much a very, very similar kind of award. But for underrated player, I've put Matip in there. I think he's the fourth or fifth top scoring defender this season. In fact, Liverpool, four of the basically the Liverpool back four, Trent, Robertson, Van Dijk and Matip, they are four of the five top scoring defenders this season. So they've been absolutely incredible value. But Matip in particular, so, so cheap. He actually had a couple of prize falls at one point. I think in the last three games, he's had three attacking returns. So he's been really, really fantastic. Let me know down below if you've owned Matip for any of this period. I haven't owned Matip at any point this season. Season. but someone that's definitely gone under the radar and it makes you think is it worth maybe going for a centre-back from some of the the likes of Laporte has done very very well this season next season if a centre-back from Chelsea Liverpool City maybe again if Man United Tottenham Arsenal do well next season do we maybe go for the cheaper centre-back as opposed to going for the full-back because Matip's actually got close to the likes of Robertson and Trent so it's something to consider for next season but Matip has definitely been in my personal opinion the underrated player and then again, in a similar vein, best cheap player of the season is actually Connor Cody. We're going to discuss this in the next section. Connor Cody has been one of the value players of the season. Popped up with a few really, really important goals. And earlier on in the season, when Wolves kept a lot of clean sheets, obviously Cody got a lot of clean sheets and he's very, very good for bonus points as well due to the amount of tackles, interceptions he makes and also the amount of passes that he accurately does as well. So Cody Matip, two very, very cheap sense backs that have delivered a lot of points this season and they definitely deserve more attention. And then I've just got at the end one to watch 22, 23. Who's the player that I think has had absolutely barely any points this season? No one's really spoken about because obviously there's the likes of Again, Bowen's one to watch, Kulisevsky, maybe Rafinha if he stays in the Prem. There are some slightly more obvious ones, but one that's really out there for me is Crystal Palace. Again, we'll discuss this in the next section. Crystal Palace have been very good this season, both for underlying data and also just a lot of their players have looked good. And I think Vieira is going to have an absolutely cracking season next year with Crystal Palace. And for me, Elise could be the one to own. Maybe Eze. I think a couple of those Crystal Palace players look really, really promising. Maybe even the likes of Mark Gehi in defence. But for me... I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. I'm going to go Elise and he might actually be in my game week one draft depending what their fixtures are like and also depending what his price is. So like I said, let me know down below. You can copy the same sort of template. You can introduce some new awards and categories as well. But these are my FPL awards just before we jump into looking at some general statistics and also my season. So we're going to do a lot more of this in pre-season. So I don't want to take out way too much of that content here, but I just picked out six really interesting stats. I just had a quick look over on Fantasy Football Scout and Fantasy Football Fix, picked out some really interesting stats that I thought might be good to just sort of review the season. And then, like I said, next season, when we're trying to choose which players to pick, looking at prices, value, we'll delve into the stats in more detail. The first two are about underperformance and overperformance. So what we mean by this is you can get a statistic called expected goal involvement delta. If that's positive, it means a player has overperformed their expected goal involvement. If it's negative, it means they've underperformed. Another way of looking at this is have they finished their chances well? And also, because it's expected goal involvement, not just expected goals, has the players that they've been assisting finished chances which are quite low XG? So it's a combination of obviously expected assists and expected goals. Basically, the higher the number, 
the better the finishing of that player and also the players that they're assisting too. So as you can see here, and by some distance as well, the two top over performers were Kevin De Bruyne and Hyung Min Son. And as specifically over the last sort of five to 10 game weeks, they've had outrageous overperformance of their expected goal involvement data. And realistically, we're pointing to Kevin De Bruyne's four goals, which was from an expected goal involvement of around sort of 0 0.8, 0 0.85. And then Hyung Min Son has just been consistently since the round game week 30, absolutely destroying his expected data. So the two of these may be looking into next season as well. There are certain players, such as Jamie Vardy's another one, that just consistently overperform their expected data. So maybe that's something that we take into next season as a lesson learned, that the likes of Son, maybe expected goal involvement isn't everything, but that is definitely interesting there. You can see De Bruyne almost positive 10, which is just a ridiculous underlying data there. And then the two biggest underperformers are Dwight McNeil, which is just a random one chucked in there, a minus 6.81. So he was expected to get an extra 6.8 FPL returns, which is absolutely ridiculous there. And then the second one is Sadio Mane, who's actually had a pretty decent season, but maybe for his price tag, apart from the last few game weeks, maybe didn't quite live up to that price tag. But you can see here, he's had an underperformance under of minus 5.02 expected goal involvement delta, which again su suggests that he was probably expected to get an extra five attacking returns on what he actually finished the season with so this this statistic i'm going to try and use it a little bit more next season because i think it's interesting and sometimes it can be used to try and predict who's going to start scoring in future weeks if a player is underperforming their expected data by like 10 it probably means at some point they'll start to catch up but again some players such as son do overperform on a consistent basis so i thought that was quite interesting to look at we'll look at that in a little bit more detail in pre-season the next thing is that the three players with the highest non-penalty expected goals this season is Salah, Mane and Jota. And that just demonstrates that that Liverpool front three are absolutely outrageously good. If Salah does end up leaving, which there's been some rumours about, Diaz could be an exceptional option. Even if he doesn't, I expect to Di Diaz is basically in their, their first choice front three now. So maybe Diaz will overtake Jota next season. I've got my eye on Diaz's price tag, although I have a feeling he could be up to the likes of sort of 9, 9.5 million, which would probably be a little bit too much with the, the rotation that we're likely to see if they all stay at uh, Liverpool, that front five. So that's something to look at, but it demonstrates just how good that Liverpool front three is. And maybe we could start with a Liverpool double or triple up in the attack. Although then we also have the likes of, again, Matip, Van Dijk, Trent and Robertson too. The fourth point, which we spoke about in the previous section with Elise, Crystal Palace have looked really good for underlying data this season. So they're actually eighth for expected goals across the season. And more importantly, they finished the season as the fourth best defence in the league for expected goals conceded which again is absolutely remarkable. Vieira has done such a fantastic job. And I genuinely think unless the fixtures are terrible, I will be starting the season next year with one Crystal Palace defender. Hopefully they sign a more attacking fullback. We've got the likes of Mitchell, Kelly plays in their ward. They don't actually have that many attacking fullbacks. If not, the likes again of Anderson and Mark Gehi could be really nice options, but I'm definitely eyeing up the Crystal Palace defense. And again, if Gaeta stays and he looks first choice ahead of Butland, maybe we just go with the Crystal Palace keeper, especially if he's priced at £4.5 million. So Crystal Palace defence, definitely one to watch for next season. The fifth point is that Leicester finished the season with by far and away the worst expected goals conceded from set play in the Premier League at 20.1 expected goals conceded from, from, from set play. So again, Leicester definitely were the team to target from set plays. And if that continues early into next season, it's definitely worth targeting sort of centre-backs and also playmakers that take the corners against the likes of Leicester. The likes of Norwich, Leeds and Watford were in there as well. But of course, a lot of those won't be staying up. So obviously Norwich and Watford won't be in the Premier League next season. So Leicester definitely won to target again, but they had quite a few injuries and they were also rotating at the back end of the season. So maybe it won't be quite as bad going into next season. And then the sixth and final one is about the most valuable players. Now, what we mean by this is the players that have scored the most points respective to their price. You can actually filter this on the official Fantasy Premier League site. But the five most valuable players this season were Matip, Bowen and Cody the first. They are the three most valuable. This is in order. So Matic was the most valuable. Bowen second. Cody in third. And that goes back to the FPL awards that we just gave out for player of the season, most underrated and the best cheap player. And then the final two are actually Eric Dyer, which is a random one chucked in there. Not many of us would have owned Dyer. And also Cancelo, despite being priced fairly high at the start, it was about 6.5 million, I believe. Still one of the most valuable players just due to the amount of sheer points that he got. This does show that maybe next season we need to start looking at these cheaper centre-backs. Matip, Cody and Dyer. no one would have picked those at the start of the season. Actually, I, to be fair, I, I'm almost certain I started the season with Cody, but that was just due to the fact that I needed a fifth cheap defender and they had decent fixtures. But that's something that we might consider going into next season. Like I said, if Mark Gehi and Anderson are 4.5 million again, could be great options. Again, if there are Chelsea, Tottenham, Arsenal centre-backs that are 4.5 million, 
maybe these are the players we should be targeting for our fourth and fifth defenders. So I thought these were some interesting stats just to highlight. Like I said, in pre-season, we're going to take a real deep dive into the underlying data and try and predict which players are the ones to target for the new season. But I thought these were six interesting ones to start. If you have any of your own interesting stats, do let me know down below. Let's now move on to looking a bit more into my specific season. So every single site that I've used in this video, all of the links will be in the description. So if you just scroll down past the Ultimate Champions links, you'll just see all of the links to all of the websites that I've used in this video. This is the first one. This is the What If Machine. What this basically does is it presents your Game Week 1 team and it shows what if you made no transfers and didn't change your captaincy right? So it just basically presents your team as almost like a zombie team, i.e. you've made absolutely no changes. It's quite interesting to look at. And then afterwards, as we'll discuss in two seconds, it will then show you what your points would have been if you didn't make any transfers and therefore how much your points are worth with captaincy and captaincy changes, chip strategy, and also transfers in there as well. So it basically tells you how effective your decisions have been. And you would hope for most of us, if we're making decisions every week, that there is a positive piece of variance, i.e. that our points have increased as the result of our decision. So this is my game week one team, Sanchez, Trent, Shaw and Simakas. Of course, they've suffered with um, injuries and also a bit of rotation. Gundogan in there, who had a really, really good end to the season and also a decent middle section. Salah was my captain. So obviously you can see they're 530 points for Salah. It's assumed that I've kept him every week and captained him. We've then got Fernandes, who had a really tough season, to be honest. We expected him to do a lot better. Ben Rama, who started the season on fire. Ings, Wilson and Antonio who are actually three okay strikers, I guess. And then the bench is Foster, Brownhill, Cody, and Luke Ayling. Again, I did start the season with Cody. So this is the way the team started. Not, not particularly great. I mean, it was a great game week one, but then it slowly deteriorated. Game week two and three in particular weren't the best weeks for me. And then we started to go on a decent run after that. So this was the team in game week one. Let's take a quick look at how much my transfers were worth then and how much my captaincy changes actually earned me. So as you can see, if I didn't make any changes from that game week one team that you've just seen there, I would have scored 2,058 points, which really isn't that bad. It's pretty good. It means that I picked an okay squad. And of course, Salah being my permanent captain throughout the season, obviously helped. If you started the season captain in Bruno, your what if team is probably going to perform significantly worse there. I got 343 points coming from the bench. Of course, that was via mainly through Simakas and Shaw not featuring at all. And 29 points coming from my vice captain when Salah didn't play, which was Bruno Fernandes. Again, Bruno didn't have a fantastic season so that's something to bear in mind there as well and basically my team value would have been 98.9 so I would have lost quite a lot of team value I actually finished the season with 104.2 team value so I've gained uh, just over 5 million team value and my actual points were 2570 to end the season I've made 57 transfers so what that means is that my transfers and captaincy have been worth a total of 512 points which is good news right my transfers and captaincy have actually earned me points so my what if rank would have been 2,250,000 and my actual rank that I finished the season with as we're going to discuss in the next section was 35,078th. 35,078. So that was my final rank. So of course, my transfers and captaincy have, have got me a positive return. And I would hope for those of you watching that that's also the case. So what I'd like you to do is let me know down below, click that link in the description. I'm not affiliated with any of these sites. It's completely free to use. It's the what if machine. You just type in your team ID. It will tell you how many points you would have earned and how many points you finished with. So just let me know. How many points were your transfers and captaincy worth? Can you beat my 512 points? Very interested to hear, hear what your points are down below. So guys, here is my overall rank progression. As I said, I ended the season on 35,078. So 35K was my overall rank. And I've got, I've got to be honest, I am delighted with that. I think that's a very, very good season, especially with the amount of engaged competitive managers we have at the moment. The amount of content creators such as Andy, Oscar, FPL Mate, who had fantastic seasons. And again, a lot of people follow their content closely. Hopefully I've helped some of you get some good ranks as well. And I just think the amount of managers that we have now on Twitter, following the elite YouTubers as well, following some other elite managers as well on different sites, writing articles for the likes of Scout Hub, and fix. I think it's very, very difficult to achieve what was the traditional elite standard of the top 10k. So I'd be very interested in what your thoughts are down below. What is an elite good finish for you? Is it still top 10k? Or do you think maybe now it's moved to top 50k, top 100k? Of course, if you finish like 90,000th in the world right now, and there are 9 million managers, that's a top 0.01% finish. That's an exceptional finish if you think about it. So top 35K is even better than that. Are we thinking that maybe top 10K is, is still a fantastic finish, but should that be our target? Now, I'm very, very interested to hear what you think. And I guess I want to drive home the point, similar to what Late Rise has done on the FPLY, that maybe top 10K shouldn't be the target now. And maybe that's what's causing a lot of us to have maybe slightly negative mental health associated with fantasy football because... 
I, I think to, to achieve a top 10K finish, you need a massive amount of luck. And this isn't to discredit anyone that's had a top 10K finish. I've had quite a lot of luck with a top 35K finish, right? But maybe when there are certain things out of our control, such as luck, maybe we should just aim to get in the top 100K and then hope that variance takes care of the rest. And if we do finish in the top 10K, that's fantastic. But I will be interested to hear what you think down below. As you can see on your screen, this is my sort of overall rank progression over the last, since game week 21. The reason for this is I did do a mid-season review where I went over my first 2021 game week. So this is the back end of the season. And I've taken this from the official fantasy sites. So if you go into the points tab and then go into your view game week history, you can see this here. Just running through the columns in case you don't know what this is and you've never seen this before. The first column is game week. The second one is game week points. You've then got points bench. So it tells you how many points were left on your bench. You've then got your game week rank, which tells you how good your rank was for that specific week. You've then got the amount of transfers you made in that week, the total cost. You've then got overall points, overall rank, and then of course your, your team value and then whether it was a green or red arrow. So I've just highlighted a few hit a few things here the first is my game week rank so you can see the main reason that i struggle to go on a real run and push forward to the top 10k or to an absolutely incredible finish because again i'm very happy with 35k is i just couldn't maintain a consistent run of good game weeks. So as you can see i had four game weeks in a row here where i was outside the top one to top 1.3 million for my game week rank. I then went on five really, really good game weeks in a row. You can see I got a green arrow up to 31K, but I did take a few hits in those weeks. And again, it was just met straight after that really nice run with three red arrows back to back and three pretty hefty red arrows as well, all the way up to 54K. I then had a really good game week to push me back down to 37, three reds in a row, another green, and then a red. So it was just a lot of going back and forth for me between a red, a green, a red, a green. And as you can see by my overall rank, it just didn't change across the back end of the season. In game week 10, I was 36 or 37k. I finished around 35k. So I just couldn't push up, but I also was making enough good decisions that I didn't drop down because you can look at a lot of managers this season. They were around about game week 34, 35. They were about sort of 5 to 10K and a lot of them finished 70, 80K. So I'm also very grateful and very happy with my decision making in the back end of the season that I didn't finish the season with maybe like loads of red arrows and I still finished with 35K considering, again, I didn't play a chip in 37 or 38. So I'm very, very happy with it. The other thing that I've highlighted here is actually the total cost column, just to show you about the hits. Because again, I was associated in this middle section from game week 26 to game week 30. A lot of people were associating me with taking a lot of big hits and maybe being a slightly reckless manager. But I tried explaining on the channel and on Twitter, I'm not a reckless manager. If you've watched my content all season, I'm very analytical. I'm very logical. I look at the best decision, the most optimal decision for my team. Yes, I use a little bit of gut feeling. Yes, I incorporate emotion into my decision making, but predominantly, I try and make the best decision for my team. And these hits were methodical. I remember when I took the minus 20 in game week 26, as you can see, there's seven transfers. Those seven transfers gained me 19 fixtures from 26 to 30. That's because the likes of Wolves and Arsenal doubled in 26, they doubled in 27, and they played in blank game week 30. So for four or five of the transfers that I brought in, each of them got an extra five fixtures across the next four or five game weeks. So it, it was a methodical choice. And as you can see here, not only did it gain me in future weeks, but immediately the week that I took a minus 20, it was a very small red arrow. Then the weeks immediately after that, when I took a minus eight and a minus 12, I was getting back to back to back green arrows here. And it was actually going very, very well for me. It was actually in the weeks following that when I stopped taking hits that my team maybe wasn't as well set up and maybe I stopped being as aggressive as I maybe could have been. The point of this isn't to say, take, to say always take hits. In fact, I actually think that a lot of the time hits are not the optimal play, especially when there aren't double game weeks. But I think when there's double game weeks and when you can attack by gaining extra fixtures and maybe getting better captaincy choices for those double game weeks, I think hits can be the optimal play. And I guess the key thing that I want to drive home here is that hits are not inherently bad. And people see hits as either good or hits as either bad. And it's neither, neither of those. Hits are either good or bad depending on the context and depending on who you are bringing in. So I just wanted to drive home that point and we'll talk about that at the end in the lessons learned section. But I guess generally speaking, just looking at it as an overview, it was a very good season. I left a lot of points on my bench this year. I think it was just due to having a strong bench all season due to COVID, due to postponements. I wanted to make sure that I had options on my bench. And unfortunately, when I needed my bench, they were very poor. And when I didn't need them, I had a lot of points left on there. And I guess for me, it was just I couldn't quite kick on with back to back to back green arrows to push on to that elite target of the top 10K. But for me, I'm not displeased at all. Top 35K. I think is a great finish. Let me know down below. Like I said, what do you think should be the target? Or do you think we should just try to be have fun? Win our mini leagues, have fun, enjoy the game. To be honest, that's what I've done. And that's why I've enjoyed this season so much because I've loved creating the content. I haven't fixated on rank as, as much as maybe some other managers have. But for those of you that are interested, here's how the back end of the season went. Let me know down below what rank you finished with and whether you're happy with it.
So we just spoke about luck a lot and whether I was lucky, whether I had variants on my side. So I just thought I'd look at this. Was I unlucky or lucky across the season? And there are various things that come into play here. There are various statistical models that will try to do this. I think FPL reviews is probably the best. And even so, I don't think they pick up every small nuance from the game. And again, I test things like that. Statistics can only tell you so much, but I think it is very useful to see was luck or variance on your side. I'll use those words interchangeably. They don't mean the same thing. And variance doesn't necessarily mean you were lucky. But for the purposes of this video, I'm just going to use those words interchangeably, but do realize that they represent slightly different things here. I've seen a lot of people sort of cite and screenshot this section. So this is from the FPL review season review section. Again, all of the links will be in the description so that you can try some of these uh, websites out. Again, I'm not paid to mention any of them. They're completely free to use most of them. So for this, you've got various things. So as you can see, you've got the, the sort of chart, which gives you a visual representation of this. But if you look at the, the table just to the right of that, you've got what your FPL live rank was. You've got what your XG data live rank was, your free model, massive data and variance as well. So I guess the key thing is I finished, this is 34,800. I finished about 35K, right? My XG data suggests that I should have finished 18.6K. So this tells me basically where my players were getting the opportunities from on the pitch. So the XG data, removing finishing ability based on expected data, my team should have finished 18.6K. So maybe that would suggest I'm actually quite unlucky. Maybe there was some poor finishing. Maybe there were some other things at play there. But the XG data would suggest that I probably should have finished 18.6K. So maybe I can feel slightly hard done by there. The free model and massive data model, what this essentially shows is it plots your team according to what the FPL review model thinks your team should have scored every week based on their projections. So the free model is slightly less accurate than the massive data model. So let's go for the massive data model. That is projecting me to finish 6.7k based on the decisions that I've made this my, based on this season and also the way that my team has been set up each week. So again, it tends to be anyway, if you're an engaged manager, your massive data is usually anyway, slightly lower than your FPL live rank. The reason for that is we make optimal decisions based on data. And some of us, you might use the algorithm teams anyway. So for a lot of us, our massive data live rank will be slightly lower than our FPL rank. But once again, this suggests that both my XG data and my massive data suggest that maybe I should have finished in a slightly better position. The final one is variance, which is I think is the, probably the most interesting one to look at here. So this is basically how much luck you've had on your side, right? How much positive or negative variance you've had. So if it's a positive number, it means you have had a bit of luck on your side. You've had a bit of positive variance. If it's a negative number, it means you've had a little bit of negative variance or you've been a little bit unlucky. Almost every manager or most managers anyway will probably have slight variance on their slide. They'll have slightly uh, a slight positive number, especially if you have a good rank. If you have a really poor rank, there's a good chance that you've got negative variance, right? But I would say if you're probably in the top 15, 10K, most of you guys will probably have a positive variance number. Just to give you an idea of where most people sit, the Elite 1000, as you can see on the screenshot, you can actually select the Elite 1000. The Elite 1000 tend to sit between 68 and 70% variance, right? So my 67 7% variance. Yes, I have gained 37.3 points via positive variance or luck, but that is in line roughly with what the Elite 1000 achieve and what most managers will achieve around that sort of 65 to 70% variance. What that essentially means, as you can see in the text below, is yes, I was slightly lucky, but those around me were probably slightly luckier, hence my, my expected data and massive data live rank right? So I was slightly lucky, but those around me and potentially you yourself were slightly luckier, i.e. you had slightly more positive variance. That is my interpretation of this. Apologies if I got that slightly wrong in the explanation or I'm not quite clear in this, but essentially what you can do by using this, this season review element on FPL review, is you can get a bit of an idea. According to the projections and algorithms, how should your team have performed? According to expected data, how should your team have performed? And based on that, what was your level of variance or luck? So putting it all together, I was slightly lucky, but other managers in and around my rank were probably even luckier. So I guess I can count myself slightly hard done by. But realistically, if I look across my season, I was never on track for a top 10K finish. I didn't make the correct decisions to get a top 10K finish. And the outcomes were never positive enough for me for, to achieve that. So I think a 35K rank for me is, is probably about in line with what I deserve and what I should have achieved. Maybe pushing towards top 25K, top 20K. At the end of the day, I'm very happy. Use the link in the description to get your variance data and also your XG data and your massive data. And let me know down below in the comments how lucky or how much variance did you have. So if you want to know where my season went wrong, this is 100% where it went wrong. My captaincy total points and selections for the season just went absolutely horrifically. So I finished the season with 634 total captain points. 
in some seasons, that's actually very good. But when you consider the fact that there were so many hauls this season and so many double game weeks, 6-3-4 isn't good at all. So the most captained, the manager with the highest captaincy points this season in the FPL database was actually 908. 900. So I'm 274 points behind the top captaincy picker this season. 270. And again, I'm not expecting to ever be the top captaincy picker, but I, I know a lot of people have been posting theirs on Twitter. Most people that I've seen are sitting between about 780 and 800 captaincy points. And at least those managers with a similar rank to me and maybe pushing towards the top 10K. And I just look and if I could have even got, not even pushing 800, if I could have got an extra 50 points from my captaincy, I'd be in the top 10K. So even if I had average mediocre captaincy this season, I would have finished in a better position. So for me, if I look at the one thing that has defined my season, it has to be captaincy. It's not like I'm sitting here with 800 captaincy points going, if I'd have got an extra 50 captaincy points, I would have finished in the top 10K. I'm sitting here with very poor captaincy points and thinking this is where my season was defined. This is where I, again, I don't want to keep talking about the top 10K and I've said I won't, but where I could have won more mini leagues, where I could have got even an even better finish, an even better season. And I'm going to try and highlight some of the mistakes I've made and where I could have gone wrong in this section and the next section. But as you can see, this is from Game Week 22 onwards. There's a lot of red captaincy blanks. And even the green ones, there, there were better captaincy options in a lot of those weeks. So captaincy in 22, Bruno Fernandes got 14. So I could have got 28 points from Bruno there. So that was a big one. Josh King in 23. I think most of us captained a Watford striker anyway. I look at 27 and 28. 28 in particular was a massive one. That was a double game week. 27 was the week that I free hit. Their course did, was um, really struggled in comparison to the likes of Kane and Son. There were quite a few here where I just didn't captain the correct player in my team or I just didn't even own the top captaincy option. And specifically, I'm looking at from 30 to 38 or 30 to 37 at least, Son absolutely battered my rank and I didn't even own him, let alone didn't captain him. That was where my season went, went off a cliff there. And I could have really shot up the ranks if I'd have just put Son in on my, on my wildcard in 35 or owned him earlier from 30 to 34 as well. And I just decided to go without Son. And that was probably my, my major incorrect decision in the back end of the season. And even in, whether it's hindsight or not, going without someone, someone that was performing so well and continuing to finish their chances, I think I overvalued expected data when it comes to Son. And like I said, he continues to overperform his expected data. So maybe I should have given more value to his finishing ability and his conversion rate. You can see on the left, there's also some statistics here from top captaincy picks uh, across the season and who I've captained the most and the most captain fixtures. I should say that the captaincy analysis on the right and my total captaincy points has come from Premier Fantasy Tools. The captaincy stuff on the left, I believe, has come from FPL Guru, I believe. But again, all the links are in the description. So you can see our captain Salah, most of the time, 15 times a captain Salah this season. Ronaldo was the second most at five and he actually blanked on three of those occasions. So maybe I should stop captaining Ronaldo. And then the rest of the time, it was just random picks here like Veghorst, Rafinha, Antonio Havertz, just random picks across the season. So maybe I should be sticking to the more sensible captaincy choice. It probably should look something like 20 for Salah, 10 for Son, and then a few others here and there. I really went different with a lot of captaincy options. And sometimes that paid off. Like, as you can see here, Fernandez 24-pointer, Vardy 30-pointer. Sometimes it works, but a lot of the time, I think, I think I take too many risks with captaincy. And I think going into next season, I don't think I'm going to take less risks, but I wonder if captaincy is not the place to be taking risks and trying to be different. And whether you captain the safer pick, not necessarily with respect to ownership, but with respect to consistency and underlying data. And then maybe you go for the slight differentials with your transfers instead. That's something for me to look at. But as you can see here, my, my captain blanked 60% of the time against Norwich at home, right? 66% of the time against Aston Villa, which in hindsight, Aston Villa and Crystal Palace with their data maybe shouldn't have been the teams that I were captain against anyway. But I think it's interesting to look at 634 points is not good. So go over to Premier Fantasy Tools for me and let me know what was your total captaincy points for the season. I guarantee for anyone around my rank of 35k or better, there will be very few people with worse captaincy scores, scores than this. What I also wanted to look at is just where some of those huge captaincy swings were. And if I'd have just got a couple more of those right, what my rank could have been. I want to make this completely apparent at this stage. I am not someone that always blames bad luck. And when I get good luck, as you guys will know, the, the loyal sort of audience that watch these videos, you guys know when I'm lucky, I'm happy to admit a hands up. I will admit when I've got luck. And I also admit when I've not got lucky. And I'll admit when it's either a good or bad decision. And I think I'm, I think my bias is quite low with respect to that stuff there. I'm just highlighting a few captaincy mistakes that I've made. But of course, there have been captaincy calls this season, which have gone really well for me. I remember captaining Foden one week when both Son and Salah blanked when Foden wasn't very highly owned. That was quite lucky. I think he scored in one of the final few minutes. So there have been points this season where I've made some good calls. But captaincy in general, 
I think I've been on the negative side of variance. And I think I've got quite unlucky with a few of the captaincy calls. But starting with game week nine, I don't want to go on and on about this because I've spoken about this a lot this season. This was the first one, wasn't it? Captain in Havertz in game week nine over Salah. That lost... This is assuming that I own both players, which for all of these, I owned both players. If you own both Havertz and Salah, but you captain the wrong one, that lost you 21 points. At that stage of the season, that was massive. I went from 60K to 200K in one week. Pretty much on the back of just getting that decision wrong. 21 points was a huge loss at that stage. Game week 21, Captain Antonio over Bowen. Only lost me 12 points. I'll be honest, this was the one which I was happiest with my decision. Antonio was showing good underlying data, slightly better than Bowen. And at that stage, he had the potential to be on penalties. I just looked at it and thought Antonio was the right call for me here. So I don't mind that one there. Game week 22, Captain Ronaldo over Bruno. This was frustrating because Ronaldo was on pens, as far as we could, were concerned anyway. And Ronaldo had better data. Bruno scored, I think it was a brace and a last minute goal against Aston Villa. So that one hurt slightly. And then in 28, Captain Rafinha over both Coutinho and Rhys James. Over Coutinho lost me 20 points. And again, Coutinho's data wasn't that good. He'd just come to the league. He obviously did very well. I think he scored two goals and got an assist against Leeds, something like that. So that lost me 20 points there. These are just four of the decisions that have been, in my opinion, these are genuine 50-50s. I hate it when people say, oh, I was considering bringing in one of 15 players and that was a 50. That's not a 50-50 decision. Like you've considered loads of different players. These are genuinely, the vice armband was on the other player and it was, in my opinion, a 50-50 call. And these are only four of them. There are various other points across the season when I've got other 50-50 captaincy choices wrong. But for me, these are the main four that punished the heaviest. If I'd have been on the right side of variance or just made a, if you think it's just me making a poor decision, let me know down below. I'm always interested in constructive feedback. If I'd have been on the other side of variance, I, I'd have got the decision right on just these four captaincy calls. That would push me up to 7K overall rank, right? From 35K. It would have gained me an extra sort of 60 plus points here. So what this should hopefully show you is that not necessarily that you should captain the obvious player each week or that you should captain a certain... But it just shows you how important captaincy is. That just making a few better captaincy calls each week or being on the right side of variance. In all of these weeks, my player could have easily outscored the alternative. It just shows that captaincy should probably be the most valuable decision each week. So let me know down below. If you were on the positive side of all four of these, you would maybe be 65 points up on top of me. And even if we look back to more recent weeks, I mean, I didn't even own Son. But if you captain Son for his 42-pointer and 38-pointer, in the two weeks I captain Salah in both of these weeks, I believe, you would have been about 74 points up on me. So again, if you'd have made these four choices better than me and captain Son in the two weeks that I captain Salah, you're looking at you're probably over about 130, 140 points on top. So it just makes what I would say, I guess, two things here. Number one, maybe again, because in all of these, I've captained the slight differential. Havertz was slightly more differential on top of Salah. Antonio was on top of Bowen. Bruno was slightly more than Ronaldo. And Coutinho and Rhys James were both slightly higher than Rafinha. Maybe you captain the higher ownership player. It's very boring and it's not the way I tend to like to play, but maybe that's something to consider going into next season, at least earlier on in the season when we're trying to build a good foundation. But more importantly for me is making sure you have, in your opinion, the best captaincy option each week. It's worth using transfers. It's maybe even worth taking a hit if you think you don't own the best captaincy option to get the best captaincy option into your team. So like I said, let me know down below how your captaincy went, any captaincy mistakes you made or any captaincy positions where you was on the wrong side of variance. And also just let me know if you've nailed captaincy this year, I'd love to hear it in the comments. So guys, what I've got here is my team of the season, not my chosen team of the season, my actual statistical team of the season. You can see that there are two on your screen. The reason for that is the one on the left, i.e. closest to the man himself, Ramsdale, that is my total team of the season. So based on total points that they have given me to my team. And then the one on the right, as you can see, I've ticked show relative gain. This is my team of the season based on the amount of points that they have gained me when I've owned them, right? So hopefully that's, that's fairly clear there based on what the two different teams are. In my opinion, if you're looking for one website to use to analyze your season, FPL Optimize is probably the one to do so. I haven't shown that much about this video because it's very stats heavy. And I just think for the general audience, for most of you guys, it's a little bit heavy to dissect in a YouTube video. But I think if you're looking for a real and analytical understanding of how your season went, for me, FPL Optimized is the one to go for. And I think that they've done a fantastic job with their season highlights and season review. Again, links will be in the description. So. As you can see, the only few, I've only got a few players that are both on my 
total team of the season, i.e. the total points they've gave me, and also my relative. And Ramsdale is the one. And again, if I go through my player that has earned me the most points and gained me the most points relative to those around me, Ramsdale is top of the list. So he's been an absolute hero for me this season, especially considering he's a goalkeeper as well, which is quite rare to have a keeper do that much for you. If we just go through my other team first, i.e. the total team, we've got Trent on there, Cancelo and James. So Ramsdale, Trent, Cancelo, James. For the, for the majority of the season, those four have been in my team, to be honest. The midfield four, some of them fairly obvious as well. Salah, of course, for most people will be on there. Saka in there. Bowen and Jota too. Jota's actually got me quite a few points. I've earned him for a couple double-digit hauls. And then my front three is Antonio, just from that start of the season. Absolutely brilliant start to the season. And then Ronaldo and Kane, the two premiums on there. And then the bench is Schmeichel, somehow Son, despite the fact I've only owned Son for about three game weeks this season. Alonso and Van Dijk. So, a pretty good team of the season there. But like I said, some of these players, because they're so highly owned, such as Trent, Trent hasn't earned me many points because he's almost 100% effective ownership every every single game week. So my relative gain team, which is probably slightly more accurate to my actual team of the season, still Ramsdale, still James, still Cancelo. So arguably my three defenders and keeper that have been the best for me this season are Ramsdale, James and Cancelo. Van Dyke goes in there once you take into account relative gain. He actually scored two double digit hauls for me in game week 26 and game week 28, I believe. My midfield, the only one that is in both teams is Saka and that's why when we did the FPL awards at the start of the start of the video Saka is in there for me because he's not only gained me 80 points he's also gained me 32.4 with respect to relative gain Foden is in there Havertz is in there and again somehow Son is in there but what this doesn't take into account is that Son is the single biggest killer for me this season so I have lost 50 points relative to those around me um, with Son this season. So Son for me has actually been the biggest killer of my season. So I don't really like putting him in my team of the season. But when I've owned him, he's actually gained me a fair few points there. And then my front three, Ronaldo, again, is once again in there. So maybe Ronaldo should have potentially won my player, uh, my forward of the season. But again, I captained him for three captaincy blanks. So for me, it's a little bit bittersweet there. And then the other two are Lacazette and Vardy, who have been two decent differentials for me. Lacazette, again, I owned him for that period 26 to game week 30 when he got me about six assists and also a goal. And Vardy, specifically for the final two game weeks getting me multiple returns in game week 37 and game week 38 and been a bit of a hero for me to end the season and a special shout out to Callum Wilson as well who I brought in for the final day to earn me 13 points as well with a brace so a few decent strikers but none of them particularly and then my bench again once again Schmeichel and Alonso on there and also Connor Cody and Ben Rama so again, I've got this from FPL Optimize. This is my team of the season. Ramsdale has to be the hero for me. James and Cancelo, special shout out. Saka in there as well. And to be honest, a couple of strikers such as Lacazette, Vardy and Wilson have been decent owns for me at various points. Let me know down below if you can be bothered to type it out. Who is your team of the season? Go with your relative gain team of the season because again, those are the players that have gained you points as opposed to just giving you total points. Very interested to hear your thoughts. So guys, again, there are going to be so many videos in pre-season where we go through statistics, go through lessons learned, go, go through things that I think you should take into next season to make you an even better FPL manager. And I'm hopefully going to continue to provide you with the best possible advice. But I just, just to finish the season, I'm only going to give you five because I could give about 30. My five lessons learned slash top tips and things that I'm considering going into next season, just for me specifically, everyone had a different season. Everyone will have their own lessons as well. As you can see, massive caveat at the top. This was a very unique season. If this was your first season, it's not always like this, right? A very, very unique season. Be careful not to give it too much weight. And the, the reason I say that is the back end of the season in particular, there will never, ever, ever, ever again, ever be that many double games. Unless COVID comes back to that extent, we will never get that much rescheduling and therefore that many double game weeks. Realistic, you, we usually get maybe four or five and they're spread across, we'll get maybe like one in 22, one in 26, one in 31, one in 37. It tends to be more like that. We were just getting doubles and doubles and doubles. In the back end of the season, there were more doubles than normal game weeks. So it was very, very difficult to try and plan ahead. And as a result, I don't think taking too many things into, news, into the new season is probably wise, but there are some things that I do think will translate. The first thing is, as I said, captaincy, in my opinion, is the most important decision every week. Week, and you probably don't need to take unnecessary risks here. That isn't to say that you shouldn't. And to be honest, if you're going to win FPL, you do need to take risks at points. But I don't think you need to go different every week. Even if you're chasing rank, even if you're chasing your mini league, there are other ways to make up points and sometimes keep on going risky with captaincy actually ends up damaging your rank more than it will end up helping you. So I think next season, I need to think a little bit more about how I want to play captaincy and how I can try and improve for next season. The second point is that hits are not inherently bad. We spoke about this again. When timed well, hits are more effective, in my opinion, than not taking a hit, right? All you need is the player that you're bringing in over a longer period to, number one, benefit the structure of your team, and number two, score more points than the player that you're taking out. That is it. 
right? And sometimes that will happen. So for me, if you time a hit well, they can be effective and it just drives home the point that in and of themselves, hits are not a bad thing. The third point, and this is for me specifically trying to remind myself, and I said this last season, so clearly I didn't learn my lesson. I need to stop being stubborn with players. My big one this season was Son, right? My 34 wildcard, I knew my rank wasn't great. I wanted to try and push on further. And I was like, Son's underlying data is not great. Yes, he's performing well. Maybe I can go different with Sterling. It was a mistake. I should have just gone with Son. I was trying to be different. I was trying to push the boat. And I, I think with some players, you don't need to push it. Even when Son started to then do well in 34, 35, I continued to ignore Son. Best captaincy option against Leicester. Drives home two of the points here. I should have got in the best captaincy option against Leicester, which was Son. He continues to batter my rank. 36, I could have got him in. Continues to batter my rank. And I just continue to ignore a player that was performing well. So I want to stop trying to, I need to stop trying to, I need to try to stop be so stubborn with some players and just realize, yes, a player could have damaged my rank, but it isn't too late to bring them in. So it's a fine line between not reacting to last week's points, but also not being stubborn. And again, it's difficult to try and decipher where that line is. The point four is that the bench boost chip caused me all manner of problems in the back end of the season. And it actually did in the season before as well. So I'm starting to think I might just bin off the captains, uh, the, the bench boost chip nice and early. And I'll be honest, we're going to do a draft for this in the new season. I might play my bench boost in game week one. It's not optimal for your bench boost chip. I, I still think the optimal play for a bench boost chip is in a double game week. But when I think my bench boost got me 26 points in what was looking like pretty much an optimal double game week to play it, there were several times across the season when my bench scored 12 to 15 points. Is it worth gaining an extra 11 points but carrying a much stronger bench and having to worry about and plan around playing a bench boost? And in those weeks, you might even need to take a hit to get your bench in the optimal position that you want. It's probably not worth it. So for me, I'm looking at the, only the bench boost, not the free hit, not the triple captaincy, not the wild card, none of that other stuff, but bench boost in particular. I'm thinking about playing that a little bit earlier. I'm maybe getting out of the way and starting to focus on just putting money into my starting 11. And then the fifth and final thing, this is more of a psychological tip. And again, we will do some psychology videos in the summer is I enjoyed the weeks when I checked my live rank less. And I, this is nothing to take away from the likes of Live FPL, which is an incredible site. I'm going to check my live rank less next season. That isn't to say in between weeks I won't check my rank. Of course I will. I'm a content creator. I need to do so. But midweek, there's no point checking after the first game when my player scores a hat trick, whether I'm on a green or red arrow. Because sometimes you'll start the week with a 400% green arrow. But by the end of it, you're on a red arrow. And it feels much worse than if you'd have just checked your rank at the end of the week and realize that you got a small red arrow. So I think I'm going to check my live rank less. And I advise you guys, if you're someone that suffers with a little bit of stress and anxiety throughout the game, maybe you just don't need to check your live rank as much. So these are my five top lessons learned. Let me know down below if you've got any major lessons learned. And again, we'll approach some of these once again in the, um, in the new season for the preseason content. So guys, there you have it. That is my final video of the season, my season review. Hopefully you found this interesting and useful for you and hopefully you find some of the sites that I've linked down below in the description useful as well. And like I said, I've asked throughout the video various points. Just tell me whatever you want. Discuss for the final time this season. How did your FPL season go? Captaincy, rank, transfers, chip strategy, whatever it may be. Very, very interested to hear your thoughts down below. I just want to do one, one final thank you so, so much for all of your support this season. Genuinely from the bottom of my heart, I mean it sincerely. I can't thank you enough if you've watched the content, if you've liked the content, if you've subscribed, especially the Rap Tier members as well. I love each and every one of you and I can't ap appreciate you enough and tell you how grateful I am. The new content will be coming in probably only a few weeks. We get the fixtures mid-June. I expect the game to go live end of June, beginning of July. So it'll probably only be three to five weeks that we'll have off and then we'll be back again fresh for a new season and hopefully lots of exciting content to come. So until next time, guys, thank you so much for everything this season. Best of luck. Enjoy your summer. Cheers. Bye-bye.